What is the definition of a good doctor? Nice to meet you again. Nice okay. to meet you as always. Mm. It's been a while since we saw, I saw you from uh, in Germany, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right before the corona pandemic. <laughs> yeah, exactly right before it, yeah. All right. Could you please introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Ahmad Raghib. I am assistant professor of urology uh, based in Egypt. Tell me where do you practice and then characteristics of your city? Because uh, I don't know about Cairo. I haven't been to Egypt neither. So I'm very curious about your city. Well, um, I practice in Cairo, as you mentioned. Cairo is the capital of Egypt, uh, one of maybe the most crowded city in Egypt. Uh, oh, we have a population. population. Well, in total, Egypt, uh, we're above 100 million now. Oh. But in, e in Cairo, per se, it's above 20 million. 20 million? 20 million, yeah. Boy, that's a lot. Yeah. It's a huge city. It's a huge city um, where you have uh, the best hospitals, uh, the best um, neighborhoods. And uh, best traffic? And the best traffic, <laughs> yeah. And the best traffic. And the best traffic. It's, it's crazy out there. Mm. But um, like we call it, it's uh, organized chaos <laughs> in Egypt. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, and actually Cairo is one of the top maybe hubs for medical tourism because we have patients from all over the region, from North Africa, from the Middle East. Ah, so uh, in geographically, Cairo is located right in the middle. Right in the center. Yes, oh. correct. So you could come to Cairo, get the proper treatment you deserve and need, and at the same time, you get to visit uh, the wonders of the one of the wonders of the, the world. Oh, oh, uh, I see. So the pyramids and uh, uh, the other uh, legacies are near around Cairo. Yes, uh, because the pyramids and Sphinx are in Giza, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Giza is considered a city within the zone of Greater Cairo. Ah, is that so? Mm -hmm. So quite, quite near around. Mm. Yeah. It must be a great place for the medical tourism then. Yeah, we have the, the finest hotels as well. Oh, mm -hmm. so patients from Africa, patients from Middle East. From Middle East, from, from yeah. Saudi Arabia, from the Emirates, mm. from Kuwait, mm. uh -huh. wow. Iraq. I didn't know about that. We have a large audience, not just Egyptian patients. Okay, so you are seeing many international patients as well. Correct, correct. Mm. because. Like I said, Egypt was well known a long time ago. Um, my, my, my education, my university education was in Cairo, Cairo University, at Qasr Aini uh, Faculty of Medicine, which is considered the most prestigious and oldest school of medicine among the region, the whole oh. region. Uh, that's why, this is where the reputation comes from. Where were you born? I was born in Egypt. Egypt. I was born in Egypt, and right after I was born, I moved to the States with my family because my oh. father was preparing his uh, PhD in the US oh. and that's where I spent the first let's say nine to ten years of my life. That's why you speak such a good English. I try to. <laughs> <laughs> so after that you went back to the Egypt then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I spent my elementary school years. Uh, I was in Anastasia Elementary School in Long Branch, New Jersey, mm -hmm. where I was fortunate to be in the gifted class over there and I even graduated as a valedictorian Wow. And I remember at the time I was uh, I was the one that gave the valedictorian speech to the mayor at the time. Oh boy! Yeah, and then we went back to Egypt when my father finished his mission, mm -hmm. and I uh, entered the Missile Language Schools, which was one of the uh, renowned uh, language schools at the time, and we had the best teachers, uh, whom I'm grateful for. You had your el elementary school in U.S. and went back to the Egypt and studied afterwards. For middle and high school, correct? Oh, and university. So you must be called as a gifted child. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, I mean, choose your uh, university when you're in high school? I was passionate about science ever since I was in school. I, whenever I would, were to be asked, what would you want to be? I would say a scientist. But then moving on through the end of our years, mm -hmm. I, th I became debated towards biology. And that's when I wished to be a, a doctor at the time. And to be a doctor in Egypt, you have to be top of your class. Sure. Because, you know, the top schools in Egypt, it's first medicine, then engineering afterwards. Well, same everywhere, I guess. Mm -hmm. so it must have been quite a tough, you know, work then. So, 
do you have to attend the college like four years and then go to the med school? No, it's a different system back in Egypt. Uh, we, we take the whole uh, six years of medicine school. It's almost six to seven. And then there's one year of internship where you get to, you know, round at the different departments to learn and to decide which specialty you want to go, uh, go with at the end. Hmm. So your system is just like mine. South Korea is the same system. We don't have to attend the college. We just go to a medical university, Correct. school of medicine, Correct. for six years, and then internship and residencies. That's how we exactly. So you went to the med school, and then you may have had the internship, right? Yep. At what point you wanted to be a urologist? At what point? I think that uh, that decision was during my internship. Uh, year, I get to, like I said, I get you get to round, and um, that's actually when I found myself fond of the specialty subspecialty of andrology. And as you might know, the in, a, in Egypt we have a designated uh, department of andrology other than urology. I think I took it the hard way because I was fond of andrology. I, f I found that andrology was more matching my personality. Uh, it has this nice combination or blend of surgery and dealing with the psychological part of uh, medicine. So that's what I found with andrology. But at the, at the end, I chose urology because I thought since I want to be a good andrologist, it's better to go through urology you know, to, to have a more in-depth and uh, better understanding of the genital system, mm -hmm. I thought that would be, make me a better andrologist. Mm, so there is a little difference in my system then. We usually have to be, I mean, there is no andrology specialties. Mm -hmm. Andrology is a kind of subspecialty of urology in my country. But in Egypt, it's different, right? Andrology, urology. Correct. That's specifically for Cairo uh, University, yeah. Ah, mm -hmm. so getting to urology is more difficult than the andrology, I guess. Yeah, it takes higher grades. So, many people doesn't know what it is for the uh, med school students to choose a job among the many specialties, right? Mm -hmm. First, you have to decide whether you are going to see a patient in actual person or not. If you aren't going to decide you are not going to see a patient, then you can become a radiologist or, you know, pathologist, specialties like that. Correct. But after, let's say, you decided to see a patient, then you have to decide whether to do a surgery or not. Why are you interested in seeing a patient and then doing a surgery on them? Why? Uh, because, of course, the two, the two largest branches of, of medicine, either internal medicine or becoming a surgery. Correct. But when you, are, um, you have a hobby of handcrafting, <laughs> I think a surgery will fit you better. And uh, as surgeons, I know that we have the, the, um, the technical part more than the medical part, but at the same time, it's like I said, it's a, a good blend of both. Without a, without a brain, you're just a technician, but medicine doesn't <laughs> work. Medicine do not work that way. What I have seen so far, Ahmed, traveling several countries, is that still there's a strong social stigma. They try to ostracize those who try to do sexual medicine. Even so, why did you want to be a andrologist? Well, it started, like I said, the combination of surgery and mm -hmm. mental health, and that was my second uh, favorite subject in medicine school. And at the same time, I realized there is an increase of awareness nowadays mm -hmm. among men, among mm -hmm. couples. Mm -hmm. They're now seeking more uh, treatment, uh, and uh, I think that it's a very fertile uh, subspecialty you're seeing innovations day after day. So, yeah, that's, that's why I said uh, I must go for it. Because, hmm. uh, as you know, many urologists are, they are going after the rob robotic surgery, like a robotic prostatectomy, you know, the fancy robot surgeries out there. Actually, it will generate more revenue for the most of them as well. But even so, it may not be more lucrative than the robotics. It may not be more uh, look better because oncologists always look better than the mm. <laughs> andrologist patient. Most of the patients or the doctors regard it that way. But even so, you wanted that uphill battle. Wasn't there any remorse about I'll, your I'll, choice? No, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. You know, with andrology, it's a totally different story uh, opposed to oncologists. Of, of course, oncologists are the, are the best surgeons. I, I, I admit that, but at the same time, in andrology, you're not actually treating a life or death uh, issue. It's not a disease. 
it's, let's say it's a quality of life medicine. You're improving lives. You're making people happier. Mm -hmm. You're making couples happier. So you get to not even uh, treat one person, you treat two at a time. Mm. So you're making them happier either by uh, restoring their intimacy or mm. making them happier by uh, having the ability to have a baby. So that's, that was the most appealing part of it. I mean, there's a still a, a curiosity, Rosen. So you went to Dr. Daniel Osmanov in Kiel to get a fellowship. I heard that it was a grant from the, the ESSM. ESSM, Correct. right? It's a great grant. And I heard that it's really hard to achieve that. Congratulations. To Thank that. you. But even so, you had to give up making money for the good portion of your life. Even though you are married, you had a child, you risked yourself to go for a further study, to study more into the prosthetics, subspecialty where not many people know about it. How it happened? Well, I always get that question. I mean, how come, Ahmed, you're traveling all this way and uh, stopping your practice for, let's say, almost over three months? The answer is simple. Uh, there's always room for improvement. And uh, when you're used to being best at what you do or you strive to be best at what you do, where else would you f look for this kind of expertise and, uh, and knowledge and learning uh, except at the best places? And uh, with Professor Osmanov, um, the Kiel School of Urology, that was one of my top priorities because it was one of the um, highly recognized or the top five uh, uh, centers of excellence across Europe. We have an Arabic, uh, famous Arabic saying that says that the all vessels in life reach capacity upon filling, except the vessel of knowledge. The more you fill it, the more mm. it expands. Mm. So learning never stops. And like uh, my friend uh, Faisal Yafi once said, uh, you stop learning when you die. <laughs> I think that's very, quite true for the, for the doctors. But even so, so how many years in Egypt do you have to spend to be a urologist? Yeah, it's a, long, it's a long journey. First of all, you go through your residency. At my time, it was only for three to four years. Uh, nowadays, it's five years. And then you prepare your master's degree because we have, like, it's not one board degree. We have two degrees. Oh. First, your master's degree with a comprehensive exam and you do your, you, you do your thesis at the time. You're, and my thesis was, of course, uh, concerning andrology. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, in a two to five years time, you go through your PhD uh, part and the doctorate degree. That's another comprehensive exam. And then you could call yourself a uh, consultant or, in, in my, in, in my uh, case, since I'm an academic, a lecturer or assistant professor. In total, it takes you about? Maybe 10 years after school at least. Including school, then it becomes 16 years. Uh, s 17 years. 17 years. That's a long way. But to be honest with you, usually many doctors who spend 17 years of the, their life for dedicate to, just to study this field, I mean, many of them just give up. They think that I'm, I'm, fed up with, I'm fed up with the study. I think I know everything. They stop learning, usually. They stay that way. I'm not judging. I think they are doing a great job with their own surgeries, but you didn't. Why? You wanted to excel then? <laughs> no, I, I, I'm trying my best to, to be a, a good at what I do. Uh, you must always remember that you take the responsibility of patients uh, or people's, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, future and happiness, and uh, they, they, they trust you blindly. Mm. So it's a big responsibility, so you have to always be up to date um, provide the best service ever. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it, it's a continuous process. Mm -hmm. You never stop learning. And you want to always refine to provide the best service. Uh, it's, it's our resp responsibility that we chose from the beginning. <laughs>